and welcome back to Strategize This, a course in strategic management. And in this lesson, we're going to begin looking at the second of our five phases. That is the current assessment. So let's get started. Performing the current assessment is no small undertaking, though for many experienced entrepreneurs, the information may be top of mind. For larger organizations, those with global operations, completing a current assessment requires a substantial amount of time and resources. In fact, many larger organizations have entire department just dedicated to maintaining this current assessment. The end product of a current assessment is the SWOT analysis, which is intended to provide a deep understanding and an unbiased assessment of the industry and the company. The assessment provides us with a starting point for developing strategy. In this lesson, we're going to look at the analysis of the external factors specifically. But let's first start with the end in mind. The end point for performing internal and external analysis is a SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis is designed to tell us where the external opportunities potentially align with the organizational strengths and vice versa where threats loom and where we lack confidence to be aggressive with our business strategy. As you learn in later lessons, strategists love incorporating the findings from strategic analysis into matrices such as this. In 1968, Peter Drucker first surmised that we cannot assume that the trends that exist today will continue, pointing at four sources of discontinuity. New technologies, globalization, cultural pluralism, and knowledge capital, which speaks to the importance of identifying external opportunities and threats. In 1997, David Tease pioneered research that suggested that strategic management was now premised on the ability to integrate, build, and reconfigure internal and external competencies to address rapidly changing environments. Notice the integration of strengths and weaknesses to opportunities and threats. In 2000, Gary Hamill discussed strategic decay, the notion that the value of all strategies, no matter how brilliant, decay over time, which is simply another way of saying that strategic development needs to be dynamic. And this is another way of saying what Richard Pascal wrote in 1990, that relentless change requires that the business continuously reinvent themselves. Pascal's famous maxim is, nothing fails like success meaning that what was a strength yesterday can become the root of weakness today. This happens as companies tend to hold on to what worked so well in the past rather than embracing the dynamic dimension of strategy development. We are continually performing this analysis to identify where we have competency and opportunity that we can exploit, which is the representation of the upper right quadrant in this graphic. Knowing where the various lines of business and our product lines fall in this matrix helps us to develop and redevelop strategy. So let's work through a process to figure out where we stand with our business. The industry life cycle is a useful starting point. It can be used to explain and predict trends that a company will experience as it progresses through the life cycle. In a fragmented industry, no competition has a large market share. And as new competitors enter the market, prices will drop, and companies will rely on the experience curve and the economies of scale to grow profitability. Competitors will try to differentiate their products in order to grow their market share. However, as the industry matures, products tend to congregate and become what we call commoditized. That is, less differentiated. Buyers are now more sophisticated and purchasing decisions are made based on better information. Pricing becomes a more dominant competitive factor in the maturity phase, which is likely to limit a company's ability to continue growing profits. The industry will respond by entering into a consolidation phase to maximize the economies of scale and to reduce the competitive factors in the industry. In traditional bricks and mortar type industries, the idea of the industry life cycles helps to frame the direction of the industry. However, for many companies, the industry life cycle can be overridden by so many other factors. Disruptive changes can change a company's competitive position overnight, both for the better and the worse. Let's take a moment to opine on some of the examples of how that might happen, as the consequences may be an important piece of the strategy puzzle. 
Think of these sorts of factors like you might the jet stream. You want to fly with a tailwind and not against it. So let's take a look at a few examples. So for instance, consider the political and regulatory changes. You know, government can change regulations that enable or destroy a sector in one fell swoop. Things like environmental regulations, stress tests for financial institutions, privatization of government services, free trade agreements and trade barriers, etc. Consider demographic changes. Aging demographics in most developed countries change the mix of goods and services demanded by consumers. Less diapers, more health care, for example. Consider industry and market structural changes, deregulation, changes in antitrust rules, major merger and acquisition deals. Consider the perception changes, corporate scandals, product recalls, environmental disasters, such as the BP oil spill a disaster that we had a few years ago down in the Gulf of Mexico. And finally, consider technological innovation. Apple has crushed research in motion with its innovative consumer products. The cloud is replacing ERPs. Online e-tailing has fundamentally changed retail in such sectors as books, movies, and music. There are all sorts of examples where trends can change the playing field. So let's look at a couple of strategic tools to help us with sorting all this out. The strategic analysis of the external factors can be dealt with by using two strategic tools. And the first that we'll look at is the pest analysis, which means that we will attempt to identify the political, legal, economic, social, culture, and technological trends that would impact any of the business drivers as we've noted in this matrix. You will find a tool for completing this analysis in the strategy toolkit available for download at thefinancelearningacademy.com. So with this strategy tool as a guide, you would collectively meet with your strategy development team and consider the impact of such ongoing trends as you know, mobile computing or cloud computing, alternative energy, outsourcing, globalization, free trade, uh, aging demographics, um, customization and the decline of mass market production all those sorts of trends and you sit down with your team and have that discussion. These trends can have a pervasive effect on the direction of the jet stream of the industry. So what we are left with after performing this sort of analysis is a list of major opportunities and or threats to the business. Next, let's look at the industry's competitive dynamics. Michael Porter of Harvard Ilk and the godfather of strategic management suggest that in certain businesses the intensity of competition within an industry is determined based on the five competitive forces shown here. The stronger each of these forces, the more limited the company's ability to raise prices and earn what is called in microeconomic terms, economic profits. Now microeconomics has taught us that in a perfectly competitive industry where no industry is able to uh, gain a competitive advantage, Firms will price the goods and services at a point at which the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost, hence no economic profit. A perfect example of this is the hotel industry, of which I have some familiarity. What makes this industry rather unique is its transparency, as most of the major participants report their weekly results to an industry association. So it's rather transparent as to who is and isn't making money. And as soon as someone starts making economic profits in a particular location, lo and behold, a competitor targets that area to construct a new hotel, thus limiting their time frame for earning economic profit. Industries that work like this make competing challenging and generating economic profits even more challenging over long periods of time. Now, highly competitive forces identified in this analysis translate into threats in our SWOT analysis. A low competitive force could represent an opportunity. An overall assessment of these factors can be used to determine whether the industry profitability is expected to grow or shrink in the future. Let's review some of the five forces and some of the underlying factors to give you an idea of what to look for. There is way too much information here to go through all the factors individually. So I'll direct you once again to the strategy tool which you can download from the website and use that to facilitate your discussion with your strategy development team. First, let's consider the threat of new entrants, a key indicator of industry competition. Barriers to entry are a good thing for an incumbent in that they keep the competition out. 
So you would evaluate the importance of such factors as the economies of scale, product differentiation, capital requirements to enter the market, access to distribution channels, and the government policy restrictions. All of those sorts of factors would impact the threat of new entrants. Next, we have the threat of substitute products or services. A substitute product fills the same needs as another product. For example, a fax machine is a substitute for a FedEx courier. NutraSweet is a substitute for sugar. In power generation, natural gas can be substituted for oil. When substitute products exist, they place a ceiling on the price a firm can charge for its products. If switching costs are low, then this would increase the competitiveness of the industry. Industries are more profitable when substitutes are less of a threat. To study this threat, you need to also understand the cross-price elasticity of demand. Now, cross-price elasticity is the ratio of a percentage change in the demand for one good given the 1% increase in the price of another good. If you're a little rusty with your economics, margarine and butter, beer and wine would have a so-called high cross-price elasticity as people will easily switch to the substitute if these prices diverge too much. When you have perfectly inelastic demand, that is good as a customer is not willing to substitute away with any change in price. Note that the switching costs play a role as well. If there's a cost to switch to the substitute, this tends to discourage industry competition. Perhaps this explains why Mac computers have had a hard time infiltrating the PC-dominated marketplace for desktops and laptops. On the wings, we have the bargaining power of suppliers and buyers. First, the buyers. When our buyers can force prices down, bargain for higher quality, and play competitors off against one another, this will increase industry competition. Not a good situation to be in if you want to earn economic profits. When suppliers can impact the profitability of the industry through their ability to raise prices or reduce the quality of their products, you've got yourself a threat as well. So you will look at the number of suitable suppliers, the nature of the raw materials they supply, the availability of the substitute raw materials, etc. when evaluating this force. And finally, let's consider the rivalry amongst the existing firms. Ideally, you want so-called cooperative competition, if you have any competition at all. Some things to consider would include the nature of the competitors. Fewer is obviously better. Look at the concentration ratio, which is kind of the top four firms in an industry as to how much their market share is, to get an indication as to how concentrated or fragmented the industry is. Also look at the rate of industry growth. If you have a high growth industry, then uh, it's likely to be less competitive as there's a large enough pie to go around with all the players and participants. Also, you can consider the nature of the products or services. You know, do you have a commodity type product or is it specialized in nature? The more commodity like the product, the more competition. You know, consider the cost structure of the, uh, the competition. You know, if we have a large degree of fixed costs, then there's likely to be higher uh, amounts of competitive rivalry. So just look at the airline industry, for example, as the, that is a very competitive industry, which is largely driven by the fixed cost structure of the uh, airlines themselves. You know, you'll also look at other factors, such as the height of exit barrier and other factors. And while not recognized in Porter's original framework, some critics have added the relative power of other stakeholders, uh, including government, community groups, creditors, unions, trade associations, to the forces analysis. The more that these groups influence, or dare I say, interfere with an industry, the less attractive the industry becomes. And for example, think of how antitrust policy forces industry competition. This could also be a positive factor as well. So, for instance, regulated utilities have protected monopolies over their distribution service areas to deliver electricity or natural gas or whatever the product is to their customers. The objectives of facilitating this sort of analysis is to allow the identification of competitive forces that either threaten or provide opportunities for the company to earn sustainable economic profit. You need to understand how the industry is expected to change and the implications of this for your strategy development. If you're really good at this, you'll think about how to position your company in the context of these trends. And if you're really, really good, 
you'll find a role for your organization to play in reshaping the industry. Now this is what I call insight. Now is this impossible to achieve? Think of the role Apple played in reshaping consumer electronics with its devices such as the iPods, the iPhones, and the iPads. So impossible, no, but rare, most definitely. External analysis can be so exhaustive that it can become overwhelming. So another key role for the CFO to play is to focus the strategy group on summarizing which key factors are most likely to have an impact on the company and its strategy development. Again, the strategic tool provided helps you document these conclusions. You may even assign a weightings and scores to evaluate the company's positioning in the external environment. To use this worksheet, you should fill in each of the columns. Under the first column, the external factors, select the 8 to 10 most important opportunities and threats facing the company. This could come from either your pest analysis or your five forces analysis. In the second column, you're going to assign weights to each of these factors. The larger the weight, the more important the factor is. Base your weighting on the factor's probable impact on the company's current strategic position. Note that the total weightings of all factors should equal 1. In the third column, assign a rating for each of the factors. Based on management's current response to each factor, a high rating implies that management has positioned the company well to deal with this factor. A low rating, obviously, the company's not well positioned. The fourth column is calculated and simply multiplies the weight by the rating. Uh, the fifth column is simply an area that you can document any comments you need to make on management's response or lack thereof to the particular factor. While not much can be extrapolated from the final uh, raw score alone, an overall score better than three would imply that the company is favorably positioned to take advantage of its opportunities and defend against its threats. To get even more insight, you would reperform this analysis for all your lines of business or your different product lines, and perhaps even for your competition to see how you stack up. By the time we have completed our external analysis, we should now be able to document our position in the market and our overall attractiveness of the particular market. So we should be able to specify our chosen market segment, identify who the competitors are, specify the segment size and the growth potential, so how big it is and how fast it is growing. We should be able to describe the attractiveness of the segment. We should be able to identify critical success factors for what we need to do to be successful in this particular segment. And we also need to be able to answer the question about how this segment is, is likely to evolve over time. And what are the likely relevant core competencies that are required to serve this segment into the future? And how will the competition stack up in the future? This is just one piece of the strategic puzzle as we strive for deeper insight into our business. In our next lesson, we're going to look at performing the internal analysis. Until then, don't stop till you get to the top. When you get to the top, don't stop.